I'll remove your clothing for the moment. Let me to see. Oh, sorry, that's Tuesday. <laughs> oh, you can do it now. You can do it now. Oh, no. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the big Lebowski. I'm having a beverage, you man. <laughs> oh, and I'm just drinking water. I won't stand for this. All right, let's sit down. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Melanie Turner. I'm uh, one of the programmers for the Blood in the Snow um, uh, Film Festival. And my guest here today, apparently I can't even remember. I'll never forget what's his name. <laughs> <laughs> and my guest today is a man who needs no introduction. But I'd like one. Oh, well, I'll give you one. Uh, Mr. Edwin Neal. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I guess we can get started on. How did you get into acting? I know that you were. I took a lift at Coinda. Lift at Coinda. Coinda Street. I took a lift. Oh, you took. Then I got in. Because I heard that you were a theatrical actor. I was a I was a professional lis lesbian, and uh, I, I was I was a serious actor. Who got that joke? Who got the joke? Or yeah, I got the joke. See me actor. I, I was I was performing Shakespeare, Moliere, Ennui. I was a serious actor, and they came and said, "You're going to be in the movie." And I said, "Movie? <laughs> Actors don't appear in movies." Movie people appear in movies. And they went, ah, what sort of movie is it? And I said, what's well, a horror movie? Well, God. So here comes, I said, let's go in. We were late for acting class, and I had been drinking beer. A lot of beer. And yeah, because we were drinking a lot of beer, because I had not learned my lines for the acting class, <laughs> but we were just going to do what we usually did and make shit up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, the guy says, okay, let's, let's go in here and wind this guy up, this movie guy. We'll get rid of him in no time. They go, okay. So we go in, and he had a little, Hooper affected himself with this little, I can't talk right now, I'm in a meeting! Sorry. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yeah, I was in Poughkeepsie. What the hell are you doing at Poughkeepsie? I don't know. I came clean from Poughkeepsie. Nobody comes clean from Poughkeepsie. Shut up. I'm sorry, I'm schizophrenic. It's not bad though, I always have someone to talk to. <laughs> Never alone. So so if we go in, and here's Toby Hooper with his little Clint Eastwood cigar. Hey, hey Don. I said, I'm doing fine. Because I feel like a mimic people. It puts them off, you know, they don't know what to do. So he goes, um, can you be weird? My friends all go to the floor. <laughs> can they be weird? This is motherfucking crazy. So, Hooper's like, oh, yeah. we'll be weird. So I, I conjured up immediately this combination. I have a weird schizophrenic nephew, for real. He's not psychotic and he doesn't hurt. Well, he is psychotic, but he doesn't harm anyone. He wanders all over the world on his little SSI trip. <laughs> From town to town, going, hi, how you doing, my name is. Yeah, but he does all that stuff, mm -hmm. and so I start doing all that stuff. And I thought for the voice, I would take uh, Struther Martin, the great character actor from Cool Hand Luke, you may know him. But what we got here, failure to communicate that guy. And so I thought I'd do that halting him. And so Hooper's like, holy shit! So I thought, got rid of him. <laughs> so we go off to acting class and make up shit. <laughs> and two. Days later, here comes Kim Hinkle, the co-screenwriter of the script. And he goes, uh, Mr. Hooper was incredibly impressed with your uh, delineation of the character right off the bat, uh, without any guidance whatsoever. And uh, we'd like you to be in our film. I said, well, I don't do films, I'm an actor. He goes, well, and, but the renters do. <laughs> Many actors across the entire panoply of entertainment <laughs> have gotten into projects because the, the rent, rent was, was due. due. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you really want to work with him? No, no, no. So, so we did that. I said, well, nobody will ever see it. 
<laughs> and here we 50 are. 50 years later. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I said, nobody will ever see it. If you watch the credits to Chainsaw, at the end of the film, the beginnings of the letters in the beginnings in, in the second name, you know, like Edwin Neal, is a little e and a little n. Lower case, because we didn't want anybody to see our name. <laughs> so they put them all in lower case. Cut to six weeks later. Chainsaw Massacre makes millions of dollars for the month. I mean, it makes millions of dollars. <laughs> and so we get on the phone. You make your credits a little bigger. <laughs> They're already done, clown face. Go away. <laughs> it was too late. <laughs> but you can watch the film right now. Tiny little letters. Lower, all lowercase. Everybody's name, lowercase. This funny stuff. Well, I remember, um, I mean, as a child, like when it, like, because I was uh, too young to see it when, when it came out. Um, but, like, later on, I remember because it was based on a true story. I remember that was kind of their. Well, four you know, movies have been filmed. Mm -hmm. Four great movies. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all really good. Yeah. All based on the same maniac, psycho. Ed Gein. Ed Gein. But Psycho was based, uh, they made him urban. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, Hannibal Lecter made mm -hmm. him smart. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. No. <laughs> he was like, no. yeah. Yeah. he was that guy. No, he, this guy was dumb as a stump. No, he, he babysat the kids for a whole generation, the kids next door on the adjoining farm. <laughs> and when it all went down, went, he wanted our kids. <laughs> For 18 years! <laughs> you know, have you ever harmed their, they, they do. Never harmed a hair on their head? No. Yeah. No. He, the only way they caught him was he finally, finally killed somebody in his own town. Yeah. They went down there. Well, because he was a grave digger, mainly. Well, in, yeah. initially, yeah. yeah. But he, 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 he liked digging people up and making bone chairs. You know. And outfits. <laughs> yeah. Just like um, love But they, the if they went out, they, they were driving, the sheriff was driving down through the little town. He was like, oh yeah, Eileen Morrill ran a dress shop. A little tiny dress shop. He was, the front door to Eileen Morrill's dress shop was open at 6 o'clock. He usually gets out of there about 5.30. He might have checked on her. Maybe she's not feeling good. Mm -hmm. So he went there. There was no one there. He was walking around the little Anybody seen Eileen? Hey, Gene's truck was over there a while ago. Mm -hmm. He goes, oh, she got sick and Ed took her home. I'll go check on her. So they ran over to Ed Gene's house. <laughs> in those places, you know, little town, they just walk in your house. Hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. So they walked in. There was Eileen Morrill upside down, hanging by her heels, yes. cleaved in half. Mm -hmm. And the little shirt goes, hey, Ed, what have you done? And he goes, what? <laughs> They send for the big city cops because they can't handle it. Mm -hmm. The big city cops come in, and the big city cop, no, I can't handle this. I've seen it all. I've never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and there on the stove, simmering, was a crock pot full of human nipples. Yeah. So the, the seasoned, hardened cops from the big city had to take turns going in, mm -hmm. writing up everything that was there. Mm -hmm. Like, your turn. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to take. Funny stuff. But, but, oh, uh, 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 William Peterson made that great movie. Mm -hmm. uh, that was based on Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, four movies. One movie. We were the only movie that really was true to what he was and what he did. Yeah. We just expanded it to be a whole family. Mm -hmm. you know, it would have been not nearly as cinematically interesting to be that one guy's. Yeah. yeah. And that was, I think, the, the, it's the catcher of, of that movie was just like, oh my god, like this is based on a true story. And, um, so it made it even more terrifying. We threw all kinds of little weird stuff in, yeah. like, like we had a, a birthmark mm -hmm. it's supposed to say inbreeding. Mm -hmm. there, people still believe that. It's not true at all. No. It's, it's called the Epstein Barr mm -hmm. syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's, just, it's a recessive, uh, recessive genetic mm -hmm. gene mm -hmm. that only appears every eight or so. Mm -hmm. But um, we got drunk one night. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> Dottie Pearl, the makeup lady, and she's got the Polaroid to do the continuity with the makeup. And she's drunk. 
and she puts it on backwards. <laughs> the other side of the fence. <laughs> and of course, I'm you know, flirting, I registered with Dorothy, and so I don't notice this. <laughs> we, we wander out to do the scene, and we're setting the wedding to go on. And Toby goes, Okay, dude, I got one. And all of a sudden, there's this Mr. Hooper. And it's one of the little roadies. Mr. Hooper. What? what you, I'm trying to shoot the scene. Shut the hell up. Okay. What? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> you two clowns. Come here. <laughs> Do that wood. Stop oh, hurting and do it properly. <laughs> oh, shit. So here's the entire cast of crew sitting, <laughs> waiting, you know. So we have to go change. <laughs> but I but a little bit more. the way that works is if you're doing a real film, you can't do that. No, they'll fire you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and pitch pitch you off the set unceremoniously. But in low budget movie making, you have no fear. Mm -hmm. They can't fire you. They can't fire you because they don't have enough money to reshoot anything. They don't have enough money to even finish the damn film. <laughs> so you're fearless. Like, ah, my upper head, you know. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? We'll get another one just like you. <laughs> no, you can No, fearless. So we did all kinds of, we did, we, we, he came close to firing us one day. We had this scene where, it's so dramatic. Marilyn is running through the woods, trying to escape the maniac, intent upon cleaving her with his gentle. She runs in, aha, a place to hide. She makes an excellent, immediate turn through the tiny fence into the building. Boom, 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 boom. Gunner was 6'4", 380. When he was moving very quickly that way, he could not stop to go into the opening. So he went by the opening. It's in the film. And he comes back and then goes to the opening. So Jimmy C. Down, I was sitting there going, and I'm just, Jimmy, look at this shit. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you're not going to do anything, Larry. I said, the hell I'm not. <laughs> I'm behind the camera. Here comes Gunner. Hooper turned around, cut that out! <laughs> Did he <didn't> fire it? <laughs> no. no. I think um, another interesting thing about um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well that I read about is that the bones, going back on the Ed Gein, uh, the, the bones were actually real. The skeleton was well, real. Well, years ago, it was legal uh -huh. to purchase uh, skeletons or bones, human bones, from India. Because in the Indian religion, the, the corporal body means nothing. You drop dead in the street, they just step over you. And you're scooped up later by the ash bin guy. Because it's the spirit, it's the soul. Mm -hmm. The body means nothing. So they've saved a fortune on the funerals. <laughs> so, but Burns thought it would be just hilarious. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a real corpse. <laughs> You'd have to know, Robert. But <laughs> we said, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they were all real bones. That's crazy. We've always thought that one day, hello, mm -hmm. my name is Karim Manan, and you have my relative in your film. <laughs> you owe me three billion dollars. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> we find yourself a mission. How would they possibly know? Yeah. Yeah. And what happened with those props after? I sold a bunch of them on yeah. Heritage Auction to put six kids through school. <laughs> no, that was the only money I saw. Lou and Vic Pirano from New York City. Bryanston Pictures. Lou and Vic Pirano. Bri Get your head around this. Bryanston Pictures. They couldn't call it Gambino! <laughs> Gambino pictures, hey! They couldn't call it that because all those are my guys. Brian's. They distributed Enter the Dragon. 
and whacked Bruce Lee. They owed him $13 million. I'm sorry, how did he die? Yeah. Look it up. <laughs> Cannibal poison. Nah! <laughs> I don't... My agent, my, my lawyer said I can't talk about that. <laughs> I can't tell you that they killed him. Holy shit. <laughs> So I think what we'll do is open it up to the audience. If anyone has any well, questions, that and I'm works. sure uh, oh. there's a lot of people, because <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of people have questions. Uh, oh. Do we do we have any questions? Usually, it's, you can remember. Sorry. <laughs> no, <they're good. laughs> no, it's horrible. These kids, they're, they're maniacs. Yeah. No, no, you have no idea. Last night, for God's sake. On my door. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's like 2 30 in the morning. Get up, let her out. In here. Absolutely. Well, because you, you've been to uh, London Comic Con, right? But you haven't been to um, Shockstock before. Where you at Shockstock before? Where? Shockstock. Because I know you've been at Comic Con. This is crazy. I'm geographically challenged, okay? If you, if you think that last night was bad, just wait for tonight. Oh, I can't tonight wait. Tonight is when it gets crazy. <laughs> we're, all, we're all getting older, so we need to like rest a little bit earlier on Friday nights. So we go to bed maybe by 2.30. Tonight it will be like 5 or 6 a.m. And then, oh, come for the karaoke at the end of the night at 5 a.m. I fear nothing from staying in a hotel in Montreal. They fly me and I'll be good. I've learned. I'm sorry. So we have some questions. You had your hand up? Yeah. Um, two, 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 two things. So I'm just curious about the stunt double that was used for you. Do you remember any stories? When, when stunt the, double? Yeah, the dummy. The dummy. When you oh, oh, oh. <laughs> The dummies, that was Hooper. <laughs> uh, you mean the, the, the actual physical? Yeah, when you're on set, do you remember, you have any stories? Any, do you remember anything like how they propped it up, how you got run over? Because I mean. Well, yes. Well, well that, that and, and also, you know, Texas is hot. And you're laying on the ground. How was it? I mean, did you get burned? Like, from oh, the, you mean, you mean the, the, the scene that's not in the film? Where, but you've seen photographs of it where I'm on yeah, the ground and my jaw. Like, well, I, I had to do my jaw like that because it's broken from run, being run over by the truck. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of movie making. <laughs> Cooper trying to figure out how I can achieve the correct positioning of the mouth. <laughs> oh, hey, I know. He reaches over on the side of the road. He picks up a large, angular, Sharp edged rock. Yeah, yeah that's cool. And he lifts my jaw up and puts the rock underneath and drops my jaw back down. And he goes, Here. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, by the way, F you. What's he going to do? Fire me? And so there's, it's outdoors in Texas in August. It's 109. It's so hot the birds are walking. <laughs> And so there's in the sky one cloud. No wind. It's moving really slow. Now, it just about the time they start to shoot the scene, it starts to be in front of the sun. It casts a horrible shadow. And the lighting is all messed up, and they can't make it match the rest of the film. So he's going, "Oh man, we'll just wait for the thing to go by, the cloud to go by." <laughs> the sun starts setting. <laughs> no, <laughs> the light. no. So, you know, now, in real movie making, they go, "That's oh, okay. Jimmy can fix that with the lighting thing." <laughs> you know, you don't worry about it. It's fine. But in low budget movie, making, you can't fix it. So you have to wait for the cockamamie cloud to go by. But it doesn't go by. It kind of gets in front of the sun, and it stops. <laughs> So they can't use the scene. And Hooper has now poured stage blood into my mouth so it will run out. And he's pouring it out over and over because I'm trying to push it out with my tongue because I'm strangling to death. <laughs> so he's putting it. Here, have some more. Oh, why not? <laughs> and so now 
the, the main ingredient of stage blood is Cairo syrup. Cairo syrup. Because of the way it flows. You put a little blood coloring with the Cairo syrup, and it flows wonderfully. Real blood does not, real blood just spurts out and it looks fake. <laughs> the Cairo syrup does not look fake. It's, it's, a, it's so weird. But no, but, but so we're outdoors in the country in Texas. There are flies the size of dachshunds. <laughs> Cairo syrup, oh boy! <laughs> the, the flies are like this big. <laughs> They've got the little roadie with a piece of paper going, oh, there's some flies on here. Little tiny piece of paper. And the flies are going, hey, what are you doing? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> so, the flies, so they're diving into the mouth to eat the carols. <laughs> After all of the, oh, oh, oh. You ever seen the thing where they take the, the egg and they're outdoors and they're on the news and they're like, hey, Jimmy, it's really hot today. We're going to take an egg and show you just how hot it is. They crack the egg, they put it on the sidewalk and it cooks. I was the egg. <laughs> I, my, I could he, I could hear my skin <laughs> cooking from the asphalt, yeah. and I go, "Can we put it together?" Yeah. And Hooper goes, "Oh yeah, we can put it together." Yeah. <laughs> did you just not hear the part of it? If you, <laughs> he grabs a little thing of like about four ounces of water, lifts my head, throws it down. Drops my head back down and says, actors are such wusses. <laughs> my guy. <laughs> so, all of this goes by. He turns to Kim Hinkle and says, we're not going to be able to use this shot. Retribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Remember the Hoover Book thing? Yeah. Now I'll get you back. <laughs> hey, Ben's the bitch. That's terrible. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, I think everybody's shy today. <laughs> They're tired of it all night, young. I know. Oh, sorry. Like somebody. Oh, hi. Yes. If you could have added one scene to the movie. What would you add to the movie? Monica Bellucci. <laughs> I'm just saying for a friend. I don't know why she won't return my calls. She returned her. My wife calls you. Oh, hi. Um, no, uh, the only thing that would I would have changed was to have had, like, Real equipment, <laughs> which would make the filming go a lot faster. <laughs> you know, because yeah. in low budget movie making, there are groups of people standing around and huddling groups going, uh, where are we going to put the camera? Um, I don't know. Uh, can we put it on the windowsill? Uh, which one? One of the ones in the house. Side of the house. That's low budget movie making. <laughs> in real movie making, you have a guy coming and go, house, second floor, east window, do it now. You know, it's like that. You know exactly what's going on. But yeah, I would have just, I would have wanted, could, because they had to hire from Dallas, Texas, we're shooting in Austin, they had to hire a, a package of filming equipment for $38,000. You get two trucks, four cameras, six cameras. Or fifteen thousand dollars, two trucks, one camera, for eight hundred and forty dollars. You get a fanboy in the Kia <laughs> with some Kleenex. No, it, and so they had to get the cheapest equipment package that they can get. They only had a couple of sets of dolly tracks. Dolly tracks are like little railway things that they put together like a giant. Uh, you know, like if you have an electric train set it when you grew up with. They're like electric train sets, only larger. And you put the camera on it, and it goes up and down the dolly track. So it doesn't, we had two sets. <laughs> two. What so is, what they did was, <laughs> they have to put this set of dolly track down, and that's it. And the camera, they have to put a, a lock thing on the end of it so the camera <laughs> doesn't fall off the end of the dolly track. 
very tough. But they can only go so far. Because they only have 20 feet. They, can, they can't go any further. Cut to years later, Los Angeles, the Directors Guild. Q&A. Mr. Hooper. <laughs> yes. The staccato movement of the camera. <laughs> it, what were you trying to achieve? That's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> In filmmaking. Try and think. <laughs> oh, fuck, you could do it by 20 feet! <laughs> you did the dolly pack! Screw that, no, no. The guy in the back was on the crew. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, what? What, uh, what about the names of the, the characters? Why did they not attach names to everybody? <laughs> Pretty sure was that Hooper didn't want to be sued later. I played the hitchhot in, you know, so they didn't give anybody a name. You know, all the stuff that Nubbins and all that Sawyer and all that stuff comes from the 90210 CGI versions. You know, none of it was attached to it. Made up by the Bulgarian mob. The latest film made by the Bulgarian mafia in Bulgaria. You seen the latest one? No. Bulgaria. Bulgaria. <laughs> For those of you who took everything, can film in Texas? Well, no, because there are no Bulgarian mafia in Texas. We can shoot them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so no, they, they never had names for anybody. The only one that has a name is Leatherface. And that's because, you know. Sally. <laughs> well, Sally. And Pam. Thank you. I guess everybody is. Except for the family. But the, the no. family, it's all, yeah, the hitchhiker, leather face, like it's uh, the actual I don't think family. Is, 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 is my brother ever called in? No. no. I don't think he's ever called in. No. I don't think I ever realized that until you, you brought it up. Yeah, you're never actually given proper names in it. Um, talking about the filming, I know that one of the most infamous scenes is obviously the dinner scene. <laughs> and I know, yes. <laughs> and, it, and talking about filming and only having one camera, I heard that that needed to be shot multiple, multiple, multiple times. And yeah, because in a real movie, you have four cameras, yeah. you know, from different angles, and you shoot it, and you're done in 18 minutes with one camera. You know, it, it's no, it's a little, but we were also young and dumb. Mm -hmm. You know, we were stage lesbians, lesbians and we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We thought, well, that's just the way it is. Well, it was your first Until film. later, you know, JFK, where they have 86 cameras. Yeah. And, and how did you get involved with JFK? I know that you were... For those of you who want to go into show business, this is how it works. I'm a really good, talented person, and they'll see that and put me in films. No. <laughs> That's not going to happen. What happens is, Oliver Stone, looking at resumes. <laughs> Jesus Christ, where do they find these people? Holy shit. What? Seriously? Oh my God. R Rachel, would you talk to this one? Texas, the hitch? Holy doo doo. Oof. Is it too short? Oof. Find him something. Well, we're already cast. Well, find him something. For God's sake, we want to talk to him. <laughs> for real. And so the pit casting director, the wonderful woman from Australia, goes, okay. So they conjure it up to where I'm going to be an FBI agent that's in the scene where they're spreading the photos out. And you'll see anyone, you know, one line or whatever. But in between the scenes, Oliver Stone, come here. Yes, Mr. Stone? Uh, I was wondering, yes, sir? That scene where the girl in the red shorts. <laughs> Those red shorts. The famous red shorts. 
those shorts. You okay, Mr. Sun? I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Who got those red shorts? Yes, Mr. Sun, what about the shorts? The scene where she stands, she's in the swing, in front of the house, yes, yes, yes. She gets out of the chair, the swing. She starts walking slowly to the house. Yes, yes, yes. The swing disappears. How'd you do that? It was a simple crane shot, was it not? Crane shot? Cranes are these wonderful things that take cameras and put them wherever you need them. They lift things and move things. They're wonderful. They're like $2,800 a day and $500 a day for the operator. I said, Mr. Stone, we didn't have a crane. <laughs> he goes, well, how the hell did you do it? I said, well, I would be happy to tell you, but you would not believe me. Try me. I knew this was going to end badly right there. <laughs> I said, okay. We had huge hulking roadies, one on either end of the the swing set, this far, off camera. And on command, they take the two ends and lift it up. Two sets of jumping track. Gotta be quick. And back down. All of done. Both set. <laughs> I, I told you you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> Harold, did you hear this shit? <laughs> so the production manager comes over and goes, Really? It's creative filmmaking. Well, <laughs> no. Hey, low budget movie, I mean, you're making it up as you go. Yeah. You, if you get through you know, a half a day without stepping in something, it's a good day. Mm -hmm. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Get a crane. We didn't have a crane. <laughs> Couldn't afford it. I was going to think you were going to say you, you got up on a step ladder or something. Yeah. Funny stuff. Yeah. Uh, question? Yeah. Um, you had a reunion of sorts with the movie Butcher Boys with Kim Hinkle. Do you have any stories from that set with Marilyn and Terry? I think we covered this earlier. Rent was due. <laughs> in. The rent marches on. Some of you may know aren't, that aren't on trust funds. <laughs> it just marches every month. Got to pay again with the rent. Yeah, it's like that. No, but it, it was like it was more of a favor to Kim, who I love, because Kim's a sweetheart. He he wasn't really involved in all the mafia stuff. He was more like what? You know, he was that guy, huh? They, what? They, my, what? Yeah, he was. He's a sweetheart. He, he didn't do all the stuff that Hooper did. My friend was just asking. Well, I guess he, the story behind the mafia thing with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, did they finance the film? or did No, they... no, no, no. You got to understand the history of this cockamamie. We call it the film that won't die. You know, <laughs> I mean, I could cure cancer by tomorrow. And they'd go, oh, that's great. How'd you catch your hand? <laughs> no, the film was never supposed to be seen by anyone. It wasn't supposed to be distributed. It was a Texas write-off film for the Texas legislature. We're not talking about two guys in the back alley and, you know, and, you know way outside of town. These are guys in the legislative branch in Austin who had voted in a law that you could, if you gave one dollar to a theatrical endeavor, you could write four off. So they gave us 50 grand. And they promptly wrote off $200,000. So far, so good. <laughs> then, Brian Stem, Lou and McRonald, see it and they go, hey, let's distribute this. So they gave us 250 grand for the distribution rights, uh, which was taken from the illegal money that they've made off of Deep Throat. Look at that. They held a gun to Gerard Damiano's head and said, we're just stupid in Deep Throat. And Mr. Damiano said, yes you are. So they, they, they had illegal profits from that and they paid us for the distribution rights from that. But no, they didn't. 
finance it. And th there were some people that gave more money to the film, but they weren't mob. They were politicians and, and, and lobbyists and things. But what they did was, they knew they had Hooper over a barrel. What was he going to do? So he came back to them because they told him, if you come back to us for more money, it's going to be a different deal. So he went back for more money and they gave him a, what's called a 75 cent dollar, right? They're giving him money, but it's not, it's a 75 cent dollar, you owe him. He, went, he had to go back for some more and they gave him a 50 cent dollar. We finished the film with 25 cent dollars. Ain't show business great. <laughs> It's a funny business. It's crazy. Yeah. Business. It's changed a lot. I have three words for you. <laughs> Learn a trade. <laughs> Sorry. One more question. Oh, no. So when you're filming, you know it was a write-off and everything. Did you know you had something? Did you feel it when you were filming it? It was very difficult to tell because there was so much madness and so much dope. <laughs> <It was laughs> can you can the camera see through the blue haze? <laughs> No, it, well, you know that where we were filming, the people owned a two and a half acre pot farm on the other side of the tree. Lovely. <laughs> well, price was right. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, because it was we had not seen the editing, and Sally Carroll, who did a lot of the editing, was uh, was responsible for the final look. Were you there for all days on set? Mostly, yeah. You feel like the script and the editing was. Yeah, but it was like I had just gone there to see who was going to be have to be helped off. You know, it was, <laughs> people, you know, horrible things happening every day. It, we figured that nobody would ever see it. We we were blown away by the package of it when we first saw it in the theaters, just like everybody else, because we're. John is John Dugan is hitting the guy in the head with the hammer. It's a paper mache hammer. At least they didn't use a real hammer. But it makes a sound and it hits the back of the head like this. In real life. So see the, the impact doesn't it's hard to act when you're hearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's his name? The wonderful sound the guy uh, took a chicken, a dead chicken, and put his hands, he take microphones and put his hands like that and the chicken and pulled it apart. And I've never quite figured out how he did this, but he reversed the sound that he recorded. And it's the most horrible sound you ever heard. It's in the film. But we were sitting in the theater along with you guys, seeing it for the first time. All of a sudden it wasn't, it was yeah. <laughs> Well, even the, the, the sound, like that, like that was like it was, the, it was one tight Wayne Bill. Like that. Wayne yeah. Bill did that. We we tried to talk him into coming to shows, but he's he's pretty laid back. Mm. No, I can't do that. That's like such he a, was, a he was brilliant with sound. what he had to work with. It, yeah. If you listen to the sound, in fact, a lot of people from L.A. Uh -huh. God, oh my God, how much did you spend on it? Uh, Forty dollars. Wow. <laughs> some, wow. You know, electrical tape and a small mic. That's incredible. Yeah, it beat the odds. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the cameras that we used, a lot of the cameras that we used were taken from the University of Texas Radio Television Film Department late at night by people that we had Shanghai and taken them out, telling them they were going to work on their graduate thesis. <laughs> and then we would simply put pieces of black tape. You can, you can see it in some of the stills that they have about the crew working. You can see the piece of black tape over the University of Texas RTF department labeled. <laughs> one of them, that you can see where it's peeling off, you can just say universe. <laughs> yeah. We didn't ever finish the film if we hadn't had those cameras. Mm -hmm. it, the camera, it, it was shot at 16 and blown to 35. And my favorite review of the film is from, uh, it was so green and so green. They, 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 this uh, English reviewer of film from uh, England was assigned to review the film. And he goes, well, you, you know, you, this is beneath me. You could do it anyway. I'll watch it. So he watches the film and he comes out and he says, this film appears as though it was shot to the end of a Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> because it was so grainy and green. 
And now they've taken every single frame of the film and it looks like Panavision. No, that was not the film we shot. That's the miracle of modern science. I just left. <laughs> but I'll be back later. No, I'll be here all day. No, are you here today because rent is due? <laughs> <laughs> there are <aren't> any. <laughs> <laughs> to be an unqualified yes. <laughs> well, well, Go ahead. Yeah, I uh, don't know if this question's already been asked. We got here a bit late, but the scene after you slice and dice yourself in the film. They go and get gas, and there's that mental. There's an obvious mentally handicapped dude washing the wind. That Actually, the he's not. Okay. Who he was? Yeah. Who is he? What, he what was, was he? a friend of Marilyn Burns. Okay. A well-to-do friend of Marilyn Burns who put her up. They were. It was entirely platonic. Right. And you've seen him. So it was platonic. <laughs> but Marilyn was the sweetest child. But. The rent was due in LA. He paid her apartment for a long time and was would fly her back and forth. And so he was like on the set and they had they the whole thing was there was a whole lot of madness going on before they shot that scene. The entire scene is ad lib. And it's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, where he would take this four foot rag with this Filthy, dirty water that they'd gotten, you know, low budget movie making from the gas station. And he takes this thing and he slaps it. You can see it in the film where, where, and then he where walks away Alan, and he goes Alan's again. losing it. Alan's like, <laughs> they have not rehearsed this. No. no. And, they're, and, and, and Bill Bell is like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Who is this? And, you know, this? and you can see it in the film, this soap cascading. <laughs> It's a wonderful effect, but totally, you know, all of the soaps draining down. And, there was and, and then he, and then he walks the, away, and then he comes back and again. does it again! again. <laughs> <laughs> there was never a uh, beyond no. that, eh? Like, the, he wasn't supposed to be a member of the family? Did no. He, did he drive himself, no. like, in the movie? He had to go back to L.A. Goes back, but, but in the movie, right? Taking like, care of Maryland. How, does, how is this guy working for the family of Campbell's, but not a Campbell? I wonder. Like he doesn't show up at the dinner scene. You can get away with that, little buddy. We just yeah. take people in. <laughs> when I was a kid, I thought the audience won't know what it is. When I was a kid, I thought he was and he has a face before they go to the house. Students no, he's right, this another red guy hanging up. Yeah, that's helping out at the gas station. Just a weird barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman there. Good. Is it true that the actor who played Franklin, like? really annoyed the rest of the cast because he was in character so much. He defined the word asshole. <laughs> he was a, a, an untrained actor who studied up on this. I'll be an actor. That's what I'll do. I don't want to be a carpenter anymore. I put a nail on my finger and I'm sick of that. So he said, <laughs> I'll be an actor. So he read all these books and he gets this book on Stanislavski, the Russian guy who taught everybody to do method acting. Where if you were gonna be in a mental institution, you went to a mental institution, you stayed there for three months and you learned all the ins and outs of mental institution and then you became the mental picture. Method acting. So here he arrives on the set intent upon doing method acting. That meant staying in character 24 seven. Now the character of Franklin, Loved him when he fell down. No, the <laughs> rival in the morning until late at night, midnight, when everybody's leaving, he was that guy. So we we hated him so bad. In the scene where they're at the truck, the van, and Marilyn is trying to get the flashlight from him, he thought, wouldn't it be great? I don't let her have the flashlight. It's meant that happen. In real life, I wouldn't give it to her. Ah. <sighs> He's supposed to give her the flashlight. It's in the film. Look it up. <laughs> no, no, see, I'm going to give a minute. I got a little flashlight. I got a whole flashlight. Frank, give me your flashlight. <laughs> it's in the film. I mean, she's beating and wailing on Hoover's going, let her roll. <laughs> true, true, the, tr 
true low budget movie to be liberal. But it worked out well. No, it, it's in the film. It's so it looks great. You can't, but see, Hooper, the great auteur later on. What I was trying to get these two to do. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh. Oh, it no, it, 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 he just went along. That was his directorial the, in that episode, let alone. That was it. They did all this stuff. But she, she got so mad at him. She, this, you have to understand, Marilyn's one of the sweetest people ever. Just a doll. And for her to get that mad, to wail on this guy in real time, knocking the doo doo out of him. And I don't think, did she ever get the flashlight? I don't think. <laughs> yeah, she did. She finally yeah. did? Yeah. But yeah, after, you know, with that, I think they were running out of film. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, a, it's in the film. Yeah. It's, it's, they're really wailing. She's wailing. Oh, she's getting so frustrated, to... so it worked out really well. <laughs> but yeah, but cut to several years later. He shows up. And we're like, <gasps> Sweetest guy ever. Got married, wonderful life. Woman's, you know, ain't nothing to shake you up like a good woman. Thank you from old man. She helps me with the rent. She tells me what it's to do. We gotta go to Canada and rent too. Okay, baby. Uh, but but he was the sweetest guy ever. I mean, when we were all over the corner going, who is that? No, it's not. <laughs> That's not him. <laughs> yeah. I guess because he was in character so much, maybe he exactly. didn't get to know but, but his But now, he, the longer in character, he was a sweetheart, yeah. a great guy. Yeah. But on the set, we we were, you know we have to kill him. <laughs> so we can't kill him, we haven't finished the film. I don't care. He's got to go. He's driving me crazy. No, we, we have to kill him. I said, we can't kill him. Maybe after the film. I won't need to kill him after this one. I need to kill him now. <laughs> but he was driving, because he was trying to antagonize better. You know, to, to make their scenes like. I saw another question over there. Yeah, go ahead. What was your favorite memory for the, the whole experience? For the what? What was your favorite memory for the whole experience making the movie? What, my favorite experience of the whole movie? Mm -hmm. When. Kim Hinkle came to me and put his arm around me and said, Ah, oh, we're done. <laughs> I can leave now? Yes. I don't have to come back? No. <laughs> I'll take care of you. So I was just checking on our time. Apparently, we do need to uh, wrap this up. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, this. sorry. It's 1.46. Okay. Oh, yes. oh, so it's an hour. We have an hour? No, well, no, sorry. We have like 15 minutes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure. I, was I know. Like and I'm like, I can't <laughs> hear you. <laughs> okay, we have that much time. So, what so are we just trying to do? Fantastic. Thank you. Because I thought, I wasn't sure if it was 45 minutes or so we have an hour. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> more time. Okay. We have more time. Oh, cool. I mean, oh, cool. <laughs> that's, what known, that's known in the acting trade as wrong reading. <laughs> now, you, you, you ever seen one of those movies? I love you. And you usually the director. Wrong reading. <laughs> I love you. That's right. All right. Should we go ahead? You mentioned like Hoover or Stone. Have you ever been given a piece of direction that you remember that you're like, that was a really good piece of direction? Like, I'm going to use that throughout my career. Well, like, a, like a director make an impact on you where you're like, that's, that's I was given in the entire filming process of Turns Out in its entirety one sentence from Toby Hooper. One. In the entire film. He came, Jimmy C. and I were doing the scene and we were, we were trying to wind Hooper up because we, we hated him so bad. <laughs> and Jimmy was a sweetheart. He, he would never do anything unless you asked him to. Because he'd be like, no, oh, he can't do it. Okay. <laughs> so I do Jimmy. See, that was as good as Jimmy does. But he, on the out, he, he comes over here. You know, I can do things. So I said, let's wind Hooper up. We were doing a rehearsal. We had one rehearsal. And, and it's a scene where they have the stick, and Jimmy's beating me with a stick in the dust you know, outside the truck. And Hooper, take the little Clint Eastwood's arm. Okay, I was rehearsing. 
And where have you been, you nap-haired idiot? I said, oh, that's over there at the cemetery. What you doing over there? Well, there's a bunch of dead bodies. He was like, it's a dueling Jimmy C. does. Hooper turns to Jay Parsley, the producer, and we can hear him. What are they doing? <laughs> Jay Parsley was a, he was a big time lobbyist for the Texas legislature. He'd arranged a lot of the backdoor dealing of the money, and he looked over and we could hear him going, well, Toby, I think they're fucking with <laughs> Hooper yells, cut that out! Jimmy Seedow and I turned to him and in complete unison go, okay. <laughs> He's like, oh! <laughs> What's he gonna do, fire me? Oh, he's gonna make you lay on the hot concrete and... Uh... One sentence. <laughs> Cut to Director's Fortnite, Director's Guild, LA, many years later. What I was trying to get the character. <laughs> I don't say that to toot my own horn. It was just a happy circumstance that I had a clear idea of how I could come up with some kind of maniac that they wanted. And if they were happy, I was happy. As an actor, you're always trained to please directors and to please producers. You know, you're trying, you have to do what they want, you, mm -hmm. you know. But so I was very happy that I, they were leaving me alone. And that meant I was doing okay. You know, like, a, you know, and, and if you have born with, in the society I grew up in, in North Side in Texas, where self-esteem was tough to come by, <laughs> um, it was, oh boy, I guess I'm doing okay. <laughs> it was like that. But, but so I don't, I don't mean to go, well, it was all, I was so wonderful, you wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. You know, but it was just always amazed me that he would later take credit for not just me, but everybody. You know, that have you, how hard it was for him to do all these things to get it to be the one masterpiece of it was just a very lucky happenstance of all these things happening at the right time. You know, they just, it was just magical. It was magical. All these things just came together. They had good actors. They, they had this wonderful, wonderful cinematographer, Danny Pearl. I don't know, look up the credits on Daniel Pearl when you leave here and pray that you meet him at a show. He doesn't do many shows. This guy directed several hundred, hundred, get your head around this. I mean, we're talking about five, six hundred of the best music videos ever shot, ever. He did White Wedding, he, you know, wow. it would take me 20 minutes to list his credits. You can't name a band he hasn't worked with. He's wonderful, but he gave the film, Toby didn't, you know, Danny was coming up with a long time he was a special producer. Don't worry about it. You know, it was like that. Danny was responsible for a lot of the great look of the film. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was my question. So was, was like Cooper listening to Danny a lot? He was kind of co directing or what was going on? Cinematography well, they Danny. fired. <laughs> they did fire somebody because they had to. They, they fired the original cinematographer who we went through this laborious scene. And then, I don't know how it happened. I thought it was positioned so that it couldn't happen, but I was there and it did. Oh shit. What? Uh, the camera lens is not. <laughs> Wasn't he looking through the camera? Yes. I was, man. He was looking right through the camera, man. Look fine to me, man. <laughs> so they did fire him. Yeah. And luckily, somebody knew Danny Pearl said, you know, this guy's got his own equipment. Got his own equipment! Hire him. So they hired him. He had better equipment than they were in Dallas. He was a trust fund baby or whatever. But but look his credits up. And if you meet him, if there's a show, I think, in Durant, now in Niagara Falls, he's gonna, I think he's going to be there, but... He's got great stories about the music industry. Oh my God! No, he's worked with everybody. His movies and the music. No, he's he'll tell you stories about music people. 
You'd be burning them albums by midnight. <laughs> Either that or going out to buy one, depending on your proclivity. <laughs> I'm just saying. One thing I wanted to discuss with you as well is your voice acting. Your what? I, your voice acting, because I know that you're doing voice I, acting. I am a blessed person. I get to sit on a stool in front of a microphone in an air-conditioned room and talk stupid. <laughs> I get to talk and be stupid, and I'm not even in politics. <laughs> And the stupider I get, the more they pay me. <laughs> I have reached heaven at an early age <laughs> because it is. I, I, we just did we did four voices on the DC Universe online Batman game, and the producers are like, you know, oh, uh, what would he sound like? And so I come up with some cockamamie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Strangers. Have the best candy. <laughs> yeah, for, that, for example, that's Killer Croc in the DC Universe Online Batman game. Now, <laughs> you can only do that a couple hours a day. <laughs> we get to the studio at 10 o'clock, knock off a noon for dinner. I'm done till today. <laughs> Blessed. But it's, it's great fun. I'm, I'm, it's really funny. The kids come. And they know my credits better than I do. That like boys, two hundred and eight Japanese anime, and they <laughs> they go. Hey, Susan, I was like, oh, did I do that? Oh yeah, you were in episodes one, thirteen, and twenty-seven. <laughs> That's right. I did. I did a hundred and three episodes of Gatchaman. Gatchaman was the old Battle of the Planets series that this company bought the rights to because what had happened was it drew American tradition. They had taken the original Battle of the Planets Japanese anime and they cut 11 minutes out of every single sequence, every single show, for commercials. And the Japanese were, ah! You ruined everything! No, no, nobody know why I did it! The Americans were, it's okay. <laughs> so we were the first company that did that took the entire episode of each episode, 103 episodes, and we did the voices to you know, and the whole thing. We, we had the missing 11 minutes. Well, my friends in Austin at Sony thought this was hilarious if I would just make stuff up, and they would put something up on the screen. And go, well, what's he sound like? And I would go, Oh yeah, yeah, 18 years old. Is in middle. <laughs> it's not a country. <laughs> and I'm a young 107 year old man. <laughs> and they would do, yeah, let's do that. And so I ended up in the 103 episodes doing 26 different voices. That's incredible. No, it was like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. <laughs> I don't need hands. Uh, okay, so they have a big, they have a big, uh, my mind wanders and shouldn't be out alone. Um, what happened was they had a big contest where they said, we'll give you all 103 boxed episodes, if you can guess. Because they didn't put it in the credits because they didn't want to be, that would, so they didn't put it. So they said, if you can guess all 26 voices, we'll give you 100. They did not give away one cent. And I said, well, you're not supposed to be able to tell. <laughs> you know, if it sounds like the same guy, then. How's the video game production? Huh? How's the video game production industry treat you? Well, you like working <laughs> the, the video game? Oh, he's talking about the new game that's coming out. This summer. Huh? This summer. Yeah, the new game's coming out this summer. The graphics are amazing. No, they're like, We've come a long way from Atari. Oh my God. Remember that was a little stupid? No. If you're stupid, here was Atari. Way past stupid. So, but the graphics on this are like state of the art, state of the art. And so they call my agent and uh, they say, oh, this is Gun Entertainment in LA. And we're having, it's, oh man, everything looks great. That The graphics are fantastic. We love it. We can't wait to play this game. Uh, we're having trouble casting part of the hitchhiker to, you know, to do the voices. Nobody can nail it. 
Why'd you hire Ed? Oh, have you seen his IMDb page? He's like 108 years old. <laughs> they said, no, he's fine. You know, bullshit. Just find us somewhere. They send a tape out. They call back. Oh my God, this guy nailed it. He nailed it. They got me in. He goes, who is it? He goes, Dead. Dead? Oh, thanks for sending out a tape made in 1978. He goes, we taped it Tuesday. We'll have those airline tickets right out. <laughs> Why don't you just tie her in? What? Adult swim. Oh, she's she's asking about I did four voices on uh Jean Villard's Adult Swim. Um uh, he, he Jay Villard is a wonderful producer in LA and he's taking all of the great classics and, and redoing them. But they're re being redone for Adult Swim. Okay. I don't know. You watch okay. I did not watch a lot of Adult Swim. Uh, so <laughs> we get in the studio and <clears throat> I'm all ready to work, ready to work. Professional here, Los Angeles people, I'm gonna do good. They hand me the script, okay? <clears throat> the wife is in with the producer on the other side of the glass. Oh, I, 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 uh, I can't say that. It's, it's nasty. And I can't say that. Yeah. Pushes the talk button. It's okay, it's the adults one. I can't say that. <laughs> Just do it, they're gonna fire you! Thanks, <laughs> dude. So I was like, I was like okay, okay. So I, I'm muddling through this nasty stuff, and they're, they're, they're dwarves. They're the dwarves in Snow White, for God's sake. So I, I get so carried away that I end up doing multiple schizophrenic dwarves, and I end up doing four of the seven voices. <laughs> four of the dwarves. <laughs> because I start talking to yeah. and then It made perfect sense to me. <laughs> but they went, wow, well, hell, just do these. So I end up doing four of the seven. And they wanted to, uh, they were saying, how who are we going to get to sing these voices? <laughs> Oh, yeah, they said, oh, we have to hire a professional singer. Excuse me. <laughs> I said, what are you saying? She had been singing, too. <laughs> oh, I have, I, I want to tell you all, I'm very excited about this. I have a, a country western album coming out. Um, I'm so, there are times, as you know, you know as an actor when something is good. You feel it. It's in your bones. You know, my God. This has gotten hit, written all over. I wrote this song. I could get over her if I could get under you. <laughs> no, you could, you could smell the money on this song. <laughs> of course, my friend Willie said, uh, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We have to uh, wrap it up. Uh, this has been fantastic.